Welcome. I'm Chris Farrell, and this is NPR News. So the topic for the hour is how can investors make a difference when it comes to addressing global climate change? You know, trillions of dollars in institutional and individual investor money, you know, is pouring into ESG funds. So the E stands for environmental, the S for social, and the G for governance. The goal is to invest money in companies with high standards on those three measures. And sustainable investing has gone mainstream with giant money management firms like BlackRock and Vanguard, as well as Norway's mammoth sovereign wealth fund, developing a major presence in the ESG market. So what difference can investors make when it comes to addressing climate change? How can they know that their money is really rewarding companies with a genuine stake in a more sustainable future rather than pushing some kind of marketing gimmick? So to talk more about investing and sustainability and climate change, I'm joined by three expert guests. Bruno Sardo is professor at Arizona State University's Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation. He was formerly the director of social responsibility at Dell. Welcome. Thank you. Heidi Dubois is an ESG expert with two decades of experience in the legal, corporate governance, and sustainability areas. She currently serves as executive vice president and head of ESG for Edelman, the global public relations consultancy. I'm glad you could join us. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Suzanne Fallander is Director of Corporate Responsibility at Intel. She collaborates with key stakeholders across the company to integrate corporate responsibility into strategies, policies, communications, and stakeholder engagement to create a social impact and business value. So welcome. Thank you. And Happy for, to be here. And for those of you who are joining this webinar, The Greener Good, presented by NPR News and Bank of America, please put any questions you may have in the question button, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So to start off, a question for, for each of you, same question. Um, it seems like something significant has happened recently. I mean, you had a court in The Hague ordered Royal Dutch Shell to cut its emissions. And then you had a small hedge fund that managed to get several positions on the board of ExxonMobil in order to take the, get the company to take climate change more seriously. So, you know, is this just a coincidence or is there a significance with these two developments? And I'll start out with you, uh, Suzanne. No, thank you. I, I think definitely not a coincidence. I, I think what we've seen um, over the last two decades is really this continued increased focus on how these issues, which I think were called previously non-financial, but how these ESG issues um, really can impact both risks and opportunities for companies. And, and there have been some investors who have been working on this for a very long time. But over the last couple of years, I think we've seen this increased focus, like you talked about, of uh, larger firms as well, thinking differently about these issues. Um, and so I think the more that individual investors have asked these questions of the financial institutions they work with, the more that companies have really started to ask questions of their suppliers and, and look at the ways in which these issues really can impact their ability to operate and to grow their business, I think has created this, this major shift. You know, for, for Intel, um, we've been uh, setting goals since the mid nineties. We've been publishing a corporate responsibility report, you know, for over two decades. Um, and we've always approached it as looking at it from both that business and that social value lens and thinking about the ways it helps us to reduce risk actually save costs, you know, smarter, greener practices can actually, um, you know, be good for the bottom line as well. Um, building that trust with your stakeholders and then also looking at it through the market opportunity lens. And I think what we've seen in the last 18 months, especially is in talking to people at other companies and talking to, directly to our investors that this shift is really accelerating. So while it's been building for many years, it's really kind of been a hockey stick increase in, in how people are looking at this. And Heidi's significance, coincidence? Not a coincidence at all. I think this has been a long time in coming. Um, on the activist front, um, you know, there have been a couple of um, campaigns uh, in the past that have been grounded in an environmental or social issue. Um, governance issues much more common. 
Um, but take, for example, you know, Jana's um, shareholder proposal um, on Apple's ballot a couple years ago about the risks of overexposure to technology uh, for children. Um, I think on the climate front, you know, in many respects, at least today, climate performance is easier to measure. So it may be easier uh, to pursue um, as um, an activist strategy. I also think, you know, a lot of people have said this before, but the past year really exposed a lot of things in a way that socially, we, as humans, we just can't ignore. Um, and it wasn't only a pandemic, we saw lots of catastrophic climate events and the disparate impact that those events have on those who are at the lower end of the economic scale. Um, we also have um, an administration in the US that is recommitted to the Paris Agreement and has a whole of government approach to resolving these issues. So it's all coming together right now in 2021. And Bruno? Yeah, definitely also agree. Not a not a coincidence. You know, I think the, the political discourse around these topics has been, you know, muddied at best and uh and uh the, the, the just kind of general uh societal discussion has been a little bit less focused. But the, the, the facts are relatively crisp and, and have been clear for, for quite some time. Um, and what we're seeing now is, uh, you know, instruments and institutions uh, that are very used to dealing in very empirical uh, models, uh, you know, make fact-based decisions. The fact that the insurance sector, that the banking sector, that the, you know, uh, basically the private capital of the world is realizing that, uh, again, this, this has nothing to do with politics. This is all about, you know, where do you invest for growth? And then how do you protect um, your capital from risk? And that's what we're seeing here. Uh, and, you know, even though the, uh, the activists that, uh, you know, proposed this slate uh, for the Exxon, uh, you know, proxy vote actually was a very tiny shareholder. You know, the significance of this vote is that, you know, most of, uh, well, the majority, certainly large majority of Exxon's primary shareholders, all of these large institutional shareholders decided to vote with this activist. So this was not an act of activism. The activism these days is actually trying to go against this very, uh, uh, this very, you know, deliberate and methodical approach to, again, managing risk, which is very real, and uh, pursuing opportunities that are, that are no less real. And so... Again, same question to all of you. I'll start start with you, Heidi. You know what's really changed because um, when I started covering Wall Street in the '80s and the '90s, and you would have a conversation with somebody, they would just sneer, total disdain, values, sustainability. I mean, if you want to do that, do it with your charitable dollars. But investment—that's about your dividends. That's about uh, what's going to be the growth rate here. And yet, just from what all three of you had just said, uh, that this is not a coincidence significance, these recent uh, activities, something has really changed. And the ESG, sustainability, climate change, has moved into the mainstream, in fact, really to the forefront right now of investing. So we don't have a whole hour to, to look at the history, but what changed? What, has, what drove this? Because now I can have a conversation with anybody in the capital markets and they don't sneer. Yeah, a couple of things have changed. I think one really big picture element that has changed is the amount, not only the amount of information that we are able to collect, but our ability to derive insights from that information, which inherently improves the investment process and the ability to assess company risks and opportunities. Um, I formally headed up the ESG practice at PepsiCo. One example of that could be if you're looking at projections of climate risk and rainfall, that could have a pretty profound influence on where you might build a several hundred million dollar manufacturing facility. 
um, or a plant. And we're just much better at doing that um, than we used to be. So I think that's important. And portfolio managers, as a rule, really like to have better information than anyone else and come up with the most original investment ideas. So I think that's part of it. Um, I think another part of it is um, the demands, I would say, of sovereign wealth funds, um, as well as public pension funds, um, embedding this expectation into their investment management agreements with their managers. Um, and then part three, um, which may connect to the sovereign wealth funds, is, is public policy. The EU is very much setting itself up um, as at least wanting to be the hub of sustainable finance. Um, also looking at China, um, with their 14th, uh, fifth year, five year economic plan, um, embedding specific targets for um, handling climate risk as well. So I think you've, the, all of those, the data revolution, the change in or increase in demands from the sovereign and pension wealth funds, and then public policy. Bruno? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the two main things that have changed, I think both Heidi and, and Suzanne touched on it. One is I think that the, the future is no longer the future. I think the future is here. And, you know, for, for quite some time, some of these topics were always felt like they were quite some time into the future. And, and even investors charged with, you know, managing assets for long term returns, you know, were often preoccupied and frankly incentivized to generate short-term returns. So the, um, uh, I think the, the, the incentives have shifted a little bit. Certainly the, the reality of, again, the costs of extreme weather damage, the costs of energy transitions, the cost of you know, other transitions have shifted. I mean, the fact is shifting into, into a low carbon energy system now is actually the lower cost scenario for any new money that being deployed. I think Heidi also highlighted an important fact is I think the, 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 the quality and abundance and comparability of data has increased uh, so that it is now both more available, but I think harder to not act on it uh, because it is more available. And, uh, and all of those um, you know, efforts like the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures and others, you know, in a, uh, previous role, I used to lead uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project, which is the global uh, disclosure system for, um, you know, climate uh, disclosures by companies and cities around the world. So we also saw a lot of evolution in both the quality comprehensiveness uh, of these disclosures that are fed into investor, uh, you know, decision systems. So now that the, the data is available, it's, uh, it's easier to act on it and frankly, much harder not to act on it. Suzanne? Yeah, I think building off of what Bruno and Heidi both said, I, I think Bruno's point on the future being now, I think it does make some of these concepts that felt very far off and not tangible, more tangible. And I think the pandemic also did that for a lot of us as well, um, and the weather events of the last year. Um, I, I think it's not one thing I could point to, but I guess what I would say, it, it felt like the perfect storm in a way, right? So as investors started asking more questions, as customers started kind of raising kind of their expectations, um, as our employees got more, you know, saw more in the media and got more educated on, on, on some of these issues, I think having those questions come from all of those key stakeholder groups really raised the level of uh, focus within a lot of companies and really started to change the conversation. So um, I think once you started to get each different function more deeply involved than they had been in the past, you started to get your finance teams involved in thinking about how do we uh, kind of measure, maybe integrate this into our financial financial filings, you had the business units and product development life cycles think not just kind of at the, at the end, but think really early on in that product development life cycle in new ways. Um, and I think our you know HR systems and, and people thinking about how do you integrate this into how you engage and attract top talent. So it's all these things happening at once, I think, reinforced that and really drove a new level of integration that I think brought new expertise to the table or new perspectives that I think have accelerated that both within financial institutions. I've certainly seen that in the investor calls that we have, um, where it's not just 
the environmental and social analysts meeting with me. It's we have people on our side from the company. We have investor relations. We have our governance team. We have me. And then on the financial institution side, we have the fundamental analyst, the governance team, and the experts in climate change. And so that changes that level of discussion. We're getting some really good questions from the audience, and I want to turn to those questions in just a minute. So please keep them coming. But before I turn to the audience questions, um, I do want to ask, because all of you have mentioned data, and how good are the measures? How good is the data? It seems like every other day when you're reading the, you know, the business press, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, you know, there's a story about um, in such and such a mutual fund that promotes itself as being sustainable. It turns out there's a lot of companies in there that most of us would sort of say, well, that's not really what I mean by sustainability. So how good is the data that we're working with right now when we're trying to you know, really reward companies that are doing the right thing? Bruno? Yeah, great question. Um, I mean, there's two ways to look at that. You know, there's the actual data. So how good are the measures that we apply? And some things we're really good at. For example, things like measuring greenhouse gas emissions, measuring consumption of water or generation of waste, uh, those kinds of things. Um, you know, I would say the quality and consistency of the data is high. Um, where I think your question is going is how do we interpret this data and how do we put it in the context of either a strategy or even potentially a philosophy? Um, you know, most uh, uh, ESG ratings, for example, and including the, the organization I used to work for, uh, you know, CDP, uh, tends to a little be on, on, a well, on a bell curve. So, you know, you might have the top, you know, two to five percent get an A, you know, the bottom, you know, five to ten percent you know, maybe get a D, but it doesn't mean that the A is no, you know, anywhere near good enough compared to maybe what some would say is is what's needed. Um, that's certainly true is when you start looking into, into supply chain practices, you know, what is considered best practice today is still in many ways, still not good enough on a, uh, you know, on an empirical scale, if you apply pure uh, kind of from a humanities lens, maybe. So I think the, the, the data is improving. I think the way we, we look at this data, the way we try to kind of accentuate the positives um, uh, will continue to improve. But certainly, and I think this is something, you know, Heidi will, will I'm sure have much more to say about, but how an organization that either claims a certain set of positions around around their practices or how investors rate um, behavior both empirically but also comparatively uh, within a sector i think there's still a lot uh, a lot of evolution yet to come there well since he mentioned you heidi heidi <laughs> i'm it i'm passing the hot potato um i actually think of data in on four levels. So I hope this doesn't bore you. Number one is regulatory. Um, what's required? Good example is the EU's uh, non-financial reporting directive that applies to issuers and will be updated by the end, uh, ineffective, I think by the end of 22. Um, next to level, and the, and the US Securities Exchange Commission is taking a look at this. Next level are voluntary standards um, for reporting data, like the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, which has 77 different industry criteria, probably between five, you know, four and eight for each of these 77 industries. They are a guide and not a requirement. Um, the third level is um, what I call data aggregator land, and that could be an MSCI that collects public data on companies. It could be Sustainalytics, which does something quite similar, or the Bloomberg terminal, which now has numerous ESG fields in it that can be completed. So there's there are those three tiers, and then um, that sort of reporting of data, right? The other component of data is whether data is being used as a decision tool in business strategy. And I think looking ahead, we're gonna see more of that. Um, on the regulatory front, what I think is gonna happen in the next five or six years is that there'll probably be a lowest common denominator of required um, 
disclosure may vary by region to some extent, but then there's possible that there could be competition above that lowest common denominator for capital allocation based on the data that companies elect to disclose. And Suzanne, I mean, Intel has long been a data-driven firm. Yeah, no, I think one of the two things I'll kind of add to that, I think one of the things um, is around kind of context, right? So Bruno alluded to that in the interpretation. Um, you know, one of the things that we have a lot of conversations on is we're a major, a lot of people are not as familiar with Intel. We are a leader in the design and manufacture of semiconductors or chips that go into everything from laptops and servers, but also into whole systems like energy, transportation, um, healthcare. And, but when you think about us in our sector as a manufacturer, there are a lot of companies in our sector that don't manufacture. They might have a different business model where others manufacture for them. So the, putting that context around the numbers and what that means and also companies that have been doing this for a long time, there are a lot of companies that have been doing this for 20 years. How do you understand the trends of the data when companies that might be earlier, maybe later, just starting out now, might look like they're driving big reductions, but you know it's easier with the low hanging fruit at that time. So I think that context and that interpretation is what we're really seeing in the conversations within the financial institutions now, of really digging into the data, asking those questions, asking you know, what, how is this getting driven into decision-making like Heidi said? I think the other big shift is there is this piece of how do you evaluate companies against other companies. But um, as Intel was putting together our new 2030 corporate responsibility goals, one of the things we looked very carefully at was what does leadership look like over the next decade? And it is about continuing to raise the bar for ourselves and continue to drive you know, reductions in energy use, water use, et cetera. But also, I think we're now getting questions about how are companies taking efforts to collaborate with others on these issues? How are you, know, you working to you know, drive more system level change? And those are a little bit harder to measure in a quantitative way. It also is harder sometimes to understand you know, who's, which companies are you know, coming together, which companies might be leading. So, but I do think that's something that when we th think about context of how do we recognize and incentivize companies to not just take on action by themselves, but also really apply their, their products and services and their innovation and their expertise to collectively work on these issues. So let's turn to uh, some of the audience questions. And the first one is from Evan. And he says, many individuals may not be invested in the stock market and their savings are limited to commercial banks. These banks often invest hundreds of billions of dollars in the petroleum industry. Are credit unions a better place for people to keep their money if they don't want their savings to go go toward funding climate change or funding climate harm? Sorry, sorry, Evan. Uh, Bruno. Sure. I mean, I think it's a, it's a it's a great question. I think of consumer empowerment of trying to understand uh, you know anybody with whom you choose to do business, uh, whether it's, it's, it's your bank or uh, where you choose to, to, to buy your food or your clothes is, you know, understanding, you know, what are their practices? What are their commitments relative to these practices? And then can you, as a consumer, either leverage that relationship to shape the behavior or divest and, you know, take your, take your business to an organization Whose, whose practices and behaviors better align with your values. So certainly I think, uh, you know, without giving any sort of financial advice, you know, I think there's plenty of, of credit unions that, uh, or community banks, you know, that tend to put more of the money either back in their local communities or that tend to have less, uh, you know, scaled uh, lending programs to finance things like new pipelines or new oil exploration. So if that's really a concern, for sure, uh, you can look for institutions that don't participate in those markets. Um, but also, if you choose to, to to keep your business where it is, I would say, you know, use your voice as a consumer. Ask uh, ask uh, these organizations to 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 speak to you about what uh, what they're doing and what they're looking to do different. And Suzanne, as a you know, both as a professional but also as an individual, how do you think? people should integrate ESG or climate change, sustainability um, into their investing? 
Yeah, I think as Bruno said, I think the first step is really a knowing kind of what you own or knowing even if beyond your investing, knowing um, it, what your biggest impacts are in your daily life. I think there's there's a there are a lot of good footprint carbon footprint tools out there. And also, I think as you look at under, say you do own a 401k plan um, and or you are investing in, in a larger bank, I think Bruno said asking those questions and, and understanding kind of where you are today and then start as people ask questions, the questions coming from individual investors has helped fuel this focus uh, from the financial institutions on doing more in this space because they said, well, our, our clients are asking us these questions. So, you know, wanting to do more in this area. The other thing I would say is, um, you know, and I do this in my own life, you don't have to get everything right uh, at the start. So I think, you know, continuing to kind of look at the actions you can take that would have the greatest impact, um, using the data that's out there to understand, you know, where um, where you are invested today. And as you make those different decisions, I think understanding what's important to you. There's a million issues out there. And so understanding how you might prioritize those in, in your actions and in your investments. Um, but a lot of good resources, um, more and more, uh, in terms of understanding um, you know, what firms are invested in and, and what ESG funds are available on the market. And Heidi, anything to add? Yes. Um, I think the first step is to clarify why you're doing what you're doing, because that can um, influence or narrow the, the universe that you're looking at. So I think of three big motivations. One is to express your values. Um, another is, you know, you have a conviction that ESG investing can improve returns. Or number three, you want to have a specific impact in the world. So if you think about which motivation you've got, you can start your direction that way. Um, the other thing that I think is, is going to matter a lot in the future for drilling down on the best products for you um, is improved disclosure and fund prospectuses by institutions that are offering ESG products and services. So, you know, just recently, the, the U.S. SEC uh, financial regulator re um, released a risk alert expressing their concerns out of the Department of Examinations that internal controls and procedures are inadequate at the funds that they reviewed. So I think there's going to be something happening in prospectus disclosure. Um, and the CFA Institute is also seeking industry comment on their proposed voluntary disclosure standards for fund prospectuses. So, in front, you know, who reads those, but somebody will, and they will, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're, if you have an investment advisor, we will read those and, and advise you accordingly. But um, that's, that's another forward looking development that I'm anticipating. Okay. And then well, one, um, one thing I was going to ask you about yeah, what yep. changed, you, you asked earlier about what changed. I think one of the things that also changed is actually the, and, and Heidi just alluded to it, is actually, you know, in the past, it was kind of perceived that in order to be a socially responsible investor, you had to be willing to sacrifice returns. And, and the fact is now, not only is that not true anymore. I think uh, the last uh, data I saw is that actually in, you know, since the start of the pandemic, ESG aligned funds have actually outperformed uh, broader market benchmarks. So there's also been a little bit of uh, uh, just kind of just like clean energy was great. And then it was even greater when it was the cheapest thing to do. <laughs> I think same with ESG investing. It was a great idea. And then now that it can give you better returns, that's an even better idea. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the notion that you're not sacrificing uh, your retirement uh, in order to invest with, you know, concern about climate change is, is really a big deal. Uh, and the evidence is there. And um, uh, I'll address this one to you, uh, Bruno, uh, but please, anybody else who says, Peter has this question, please comment on the International Monetary Fund advocating for a floor on carbon pricing with a group of 20 major economies. And before addressing that, just give us the, uh, the, um, the brief de definition of carbon pricing. 
Sure. You know, many, many people, especially econ economists, believe that uh, part of how we, we address climate change is by, you know, rebalancing some of the market instruments that are, that are necessary to move uh, financial decisions. And, um, you know, one of those theories is to price externalities into the decision making. So carbon pollution in essence, has been a, a fully externalized cost to society. So whoever has been emitting carbon has not had to pay for it, except there's a handful of examples, but none of them have been you know, significant. You have some in, in California with AB 32. Here in the Northeast, you have the Reggie states. But again, these are 6 $7 a ton, uh, whereas the, the social price of carbon that's been set by governments is, uh, is much higher, anywhere from 80 to $120. Um, a ton. And so the idea is, uh, and, you know, organizations like the IMF saying, you know, if, if governments, uh, you know, agreed that there's a minimum price to pay for emitting CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions, that will accelerate the transition to lower carbon solutions. Because if your business case right now is you have to, to deploy capital to do something that's lower carbon, uh, but there's no real cost to your status quo. If all of a sudden you have to start paying 20 or $40 a ton to emit carbon, the business case for transitioning away from that carbon intensive solution becomes clear much faster. And Suzanne, is carbon pricing something that comes up in your discussions at Intel? Yeah, I think we look at a broad range of, of, of carbon impacts and we look at it both from a manufacturing perspective and it also comes up in the customer conversations about um, how do we enable our customers to be able to reduce their their impact. And then also, if you think about who our customers are, it's all the other leading technology companies. And so how do we work together on some of these solutions that address carbon and carbon pricing and things at that at that system level. So we've done a lot of work in the last year around um, grid modernization and working with others on how do you help you know um, you know public utilities uh, think differently about carbon impact. So even kind of looking at that end to end solution um, from you know car you know carbon and climate not only from manufacturing but through the life cycle of products and how it gets integrated into infrastructure. Uh, but certainly I think some of these discussions about the regulatory uh, landscape are, are critical for us and, and thinking of how do you, A, make sure that people are incentivized to take action, but also that there's consistency in measurement data. And we're a global company, so we operate you know, around the world. So it's also important to us that some of these standards and these approaches, um, it's you know, we like to see a, a higher global standard um, so that it makes it easier to navigate and, and apply a single standard everywhere we operate. And Heidi, I saw you nodding. Sorry, I was on mute because there was a noise in the background. <laughs> I, I'm nodding because of the amount of influence that companies like Intel can have on their customers or in, you know, the flow through from the manufacturing companies to the service companies has tremendous um, potential, I think. The other thing I was, I've sort of been wondering about with the IMF is we have, you know, the, the world negotiating right now a global like minimum corporate tax right um if that's successful and gets put in place can that model of negotiation apply to resolve this instance don't know but um it's just an idea and i think you know, companies have been, I think companies have been pricing in, you know, if, they, if you have internal carbon pricing or what your models are, is that this transition would be gradual. Um, but I think people are starting to think, well, this a, a, a carbon tax like this could be imposed quite suddenly, which would be quite disruptive. So getting ready now um, might be a good idea. And mm -hmm. This is being considered more like in Europe, Europe and elsewhere. I mean, it's being considered more seriously than here in the U.S. Am I right about that? I think so. You have, um, you... Go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. Go ahead, Ivy. 
No, I mean, I, I'm just watching carefully. I mean, this whole this whole of government approach um, with the administration and the potentially massive investment in infrastructure, which has green infrastructure implied. I mean, if that all goes through, the U.S. might not be so far behind Europe. Bruno? Yeah, I mean, I think I think an economy-wide uh, significant price on carbon is is unlikely uh, in this in this political environment in the U.S. But it, you know, the question is, you know, will it ultimately have to wait for politicians? You have m most of, frankly, the oil and gas sector has been already, you know, modeling carbon price. You know, base usually a base price of forty dollars a ton with a stress case of eighty, and I think they've kind of started raising that stress case higher, um, you know, and, and frankly, what they've concluded is they can still make money even if they were paying, you know, 40, 60, 80 dollars a ton in, uh, in a carbon price. I think what um, Heidi talks about is really important is this idea of, of leakage, you know, and you see that even here in the U.S. I mentioned earlier, there's a, there's a set of uh, states in the Midwest and the Northeast that are part of this thing called the REGI or, uh, you know, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that apply today a carbon price. It's less than $10 to, to power generators, uh, but the states that are not part of that uh, because of the way the grid works, um, if you don't count Texas, because Texas does things differently, but where <laughs> you can basically load balance with uh, power generators from multiple states, a generator that is not that it is based in a state that is not part of Reggie, like let's say Maryland, um, has a an advantage, a disproportionate advantage, because all of a sudden, basically, they could sell power for let's say five dollars less per megawatt hour uh, and make uh, still two two dollars more of profit than somebody based, let's say, in New Jersey. So I think this idea of how do you create a system that draws uh, boundaries. To, to a point where it, again, shapes behavior that you want as opposed to behavior that you don't want, like pushing your pollution away in states or, or countries where, you know, that regulation floor will not be, um, you know, uh, enough. Of, enough. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think the other thing that would be you know, what that I think Heidi touched on is, you know, with with the discussions around regulatory you know, action and different pieces, I think, um, as companies seek to take action and, and position themselves as effectively as possible in that landscape, I mean, that's what has driven, um, you know, rapid adoption or increased goal setting around 100% renewable energy. So, um, you know, Intel has set um, a goal to be 100% renewable energy globally by 2030. We're already around 82%. We've set a goal to become net positive water. Water is a critical linkage into the climate change discussion as well. That means not only conserving in our own operations, but working to invest in projects with others in the watersheds where we operate with, with environmental organizations. So, I, and, we, and we've seen this play out in lots of different sectors of it really driving that conversation of how, how do you get ready how do you really reduce your risk? How do you, um, and then as we talked about, ways in which you can create that opportunity by working with customers and being that you know, that supplier and partner of choice and, and really trying to drive some of that innovation in these solutions. I think that's one of the most exciting pieces of all of this is you're starting to see more people and startups and different um, organizations really change the way that they design their business processes from the beginning or design their products from the beginning. And I think I'm hopeful that, you know, there's a lot that has to be done to really just, you know, reduce emissions related to operations. But I also think the more you can get um, this incentive piece and integration into kind of uh, the, the solution side, especially in the, how the role technology can play, um, I think that's that's another place where I'm excited to see more more focus. And um, Heidi, I'm going to direct this one to you, uh, and it's from Jennifer, and she asks, um, can your panel talk more about what kind of changes they are seeing in big oil investments? The impact of the pandemic temporarily, temporarily reduced oil consumption, but that is rebounding with loosening of travel restrictions. Yet we are still building new and larger oil pipelines in the U.S. So is oil, how is oil becoming more sustainable? Good question. I don't know that oil per se will ever become more sustainable. I did see a pretty interesting article in the Wall Street Journal this morning um, 
that was talking about how Wall Street's appetite for green energy investing may result in depressed production of oil, which would cause prices to increase <laughs> um, for our current sources of energy. I'm not answering the question, but um, some of the consequences of our actions, you know, they, they have social impacts that are positive and negative, which is also maybe we'll talk about the energy transition, uh, but that is a topic. I think a lot about the energy transition and the equitable energy transition and how, what role do oil and, you know, transition feels like hydrogen play um, liquefied natural gas in, in that arc. Well, talk a little bit about the energy transition. Well, why don't we start with the fact that 940 million people globally have no access to electricity at all. Um, so when you think about the developing world, how do we enable access to energy as a global development matter while transitioning to more sustainable forms of energy? Um, I think that's a tough nut to crack and, you know, I'm not an investor myself, um, but I do wonder if there will be some sort of growth in the interim fuels like liquid hydrogen. And also what uh, we have a, a question, what about nuclear power, which uh, there seems to be more conversation again these days with uh, Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett have been talking about nuclear power. So, uh, Bruno, with this energy transition. Yeah, you know, I actually uh, teach teach a course on energy transitions at, at ASU. I mean, I think there's, there's two fundamental uh, dynamics. Well, there's plenty more, but I think one is, is what Heidi just talked about, is that demand for energy is not abating. And, and if we do our job right and really kind of trying to you know, elevate the livelihoods of many of the people who who um, who don't have you know an adequate standard of living now. You know, ener total energy demand is going to continue to grow. And then, with a warming planet, you know, there's an estimate that the world needs, for example, an additional billion air conditioners uh, to be brought in line online uh, in the next uh, ten years or so. Uh, you know, so I think the demand is not going to change. Now, the supply is rapidly evolving um you know if you look at for example the new power coming online in the us this year in 2021 about 80 percent of it is pretty much carbon free hardly any of it is nuclear there's a tiny bit because there's a new nuclear coming online at an existing nuclear power plant in uh, georgia i believe um but other than that you know about 80 percent of all um new power is uh, is Carbon free, about 10% of the 80 is actually battery storage. And then the rest is new solar, new wind. And then the remaining 20 or so percent is some, uh, is some fast start natural gas. Uh, you see, you know, the electrification of ground transportation is rapidly accelerating with more and more large brands now uh, making commitments that by, you know, maybe 2030, 2035, they'll phase out uh, internal combustion. Uh, so I think the, the the supply will keep changing. Nuclear, frankly, I'm I'm um, I'm in more of the wait and see. I think today, you know, it still doesn't make financial se sense. You know, if you're going to try to bring new power online, that nuclear is just not a good not a good way to spend your money. Now, will will there be breakthroughs in, in some of these kind of uh, smaller reactors, some of these new new technologies that some of these groups like Gates and others are, are funding maybe? And if that's the case, then uh, I think that'll become uh, uh, more uh, more likely. But uh, for today, I think a new nuclear is, is, you know, it would be very hard to raise serious money to make that happen, just like new coal. You know, nobody's really putting money, uh, serious money into new coal unless it's massively uh, subsidized and that was part of the uh, the conversation at the g7 is uh, is whether governments should stop subsidizing coal because coal unsubsidized coal today makes sense nowhere in the world and suzanne thoughts about this energy transition yeah, I think one of the things that um, I think all of us have experienced over the last year is the um, 
just the digitization of everything and and kind of the work from home and learn from home and um, and and so I think from that we have already been on this path for. Um, moving to this kind of very data-centric world. And I think one of the key discussions in the energy transition is also how do we anticipate and think about that growth and think about the growth of data and what implications it has for for energy. So one one area, I think where there's some exciting and interesting research is in the data center um, kind of area and, and how data centers use energy and, and how can we optimize from an infrastructure standpoint and from a design standpoint, how to enable data centers to be able to use renewable energy more efficiently. So there's some interesting projects going on at a number of companies and research institutions thinking about that. Um, things also like immersion cooling and different ways that we can think about that to support this growth that we're going to see in that area. And then I think infrastructure, we talked about earlier, um, really thinking about um, designing, um, you know, modernizing the grid in a way that, that helps to make sure that you're, you know, uh, being more targeted in the energy that's needed and helping cities to think about their long-term strategies kind of in that area as well. So I think, and, and infrastructure, if we were thinking about, um, you know, transitioning to more electric cars, that's something I know has been written about quite a bit in terms of what would it take to help people be able to make that transition um, in, in a larger way um, to be able to either go further from a distance perspective, but also just in their daily lives and access um, to charging stations, et cetera. And um, I mean, to, to, to answer the, the, I think that the question that was asked specifically about oil, you know, the last thing I'd say is, you know, science has told us for a while about 80% of known reserves need to stay in the ground to meet our carbon budget for, you know, to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. The International Energy Agency, the IEA, that kind of produces kind of the world's foremost energy forecast basically says, you know, new exploration basically should halt as early as next year. Because again, we don't need to find new oil or new coal to meet, you know, kind of this transition away from, from carbon intensive energy sources. So, you know, again, if, if you're a bank or an individual investor or, uh, or an institutional investor, uh, you know, if you're gonna invest into, into let's say oil, you'd have to look at, okay, why, you know, is it about, you know, trying to maximize kind of the short term as, as that sector transitions, will it successfully transition? Are there good examples of that? Maybe like Orsted in, in, the, in the Nordics. Uh, but I think that's the lens I would apply to it is, is you know, what, this, what, what happens to that as an investment, you know, what are kind of its historical return patterns likely to change based on, on you know, changing business model that I think is inevitable. I think that's a good place to ask the question where, uh, Suzanne, you'd mentioned innovations. And so when we're thinking about, you know, addressing global climate change, you know, what are some of the innovations that excite you or that you think we should be watching? Because there is a lot of entrepreneurship going on. So since you raised it, I'll, I'll address it first to you, Suzanne, but also to, to the other panelists. You know, thinking about, there's a lot of conversation about costs, right? with climate change, but there's also a lot of innovation going on. So what excites yeah, you? Yeah, I think, yeah, there's a few areas. I, I think one is in the design of um, products themselves, right? So I think of, of understanding how do we rethink how products use energy um, and you know, reducing emissions um, related to um, related to climate change. One thing that the conversations uh, has been shifting a bit and in, in the standards area has been looking at, you know, how do you think about something like embedded carbon? So understanding from a product, that product life cycle perspective and thinking about the design, um, you know, from, from, from design to end of life of a, of a product, how do we rethink that? And how do we think about different business models happening in that space? Um, you're talking a lot of, um, circularity discussions in terms of design also have a climate uh, impact as well. Um, I think the other you know, piece we're seeing is, is in areas like um, you know, the, the grid modernization piece, I think is pretty interesting of you know, how do you have solutions and how they could be, you know, I'm more familiar of course with all the, the innovations in the technology space, but I think there are um, you know, things in the built environment that people are rethinking about, about construction materials and, and, and how do you design for um, lower impact and design for lower energy use from a construction standpoint and a, and a, a building perspective. Um, 
And I do think at a very high level, I think Nation is, is driving discussions about, um, you know, incentives and, and pricing things in. I think that's a lot of the ESG investing we've seen for many years has been, I think, more focused on doing less bad. And I think now you're starting to see investors really ask companies what what percentage of revenue is coming from, you know, climate related um, actions and products or what percentage is, is, and we haven't talked a lot about the social aspect, but I think that other piece, that there's a lot of innovation happening in how products are designed from a social equity perspective, from an accessibility perspective uh, that I think are also, I think, pretty interesting. So I think looking at that intersection between kind of the, the ES and the G in terms of that innovation and how do you use um, product design products to be um, addressing more health and safety um, aspects or inclusion aspects to make technology or other products more inclusive. And Heidi, are there innovations that you're following or you're watching particularly closely? Um, I'm pretty interested in energy storage. Um, that's an area that I follow. It seems to be moving along more quickly and be more affordable um, than before. Um, the other thing I think a lot about is um, not really just what work is going to look like post-COVID, um, but um, how do we design career paths um, that enable who are currently underrepresented groups access to um, P&L roles as they go up the corporate chain of command? Um, more often than not, you'll see someone from an underrepresented group when they rise up and they go into um, um, a support role, not a revenue generating role. Um, and the path to CEO is paved with P&L roles. Um, so I'm interested to see how companies rethink that and restructure the talent and development pipeline and planning um, to enable that kind of progression for underrepresented groups. And are, you know, jobs in companies dealing with sustainability, are those considered revenue generating? Are those considered uh, support roles? Heidi? Susan, do you want to take that given that you're currently heading that function? <laughs> Yeah, I think I think historically and, and probably still today, they, they are kind of looked at as corporate functions and support roles. I think what we're seeing, which I think is, is a really important transformation, is those that are in PNL roles having sustainability expectations um, or in expectations for your broader corporate responsibility and, and kind of product development pieces related to sustainability as part of what they do. Um, you know, one thing that's been interesting, I think we've seen this at most companies, is just the, the level of C-suite engagement in these issues and um, and also just different accountability measures. So one thing you know, we've done at Intel and you're seeing more companies do this is linking a portion of executive compensation to the outcomes related to inclusion or uh, sustainability factors, including climate goals. And that I think has also changed the conversation as well. Um, so I think it's maybe not an, uh, not an either or, but understanding the strategic importance of some of these support roles, I think, and then how those relate to the company's overall Overall strategy and getting those who do have the PL roles to take a, a broader engaging uh, position and more responsibility for how their group delivers uh, on these issues. And yeah, Bruno, if I, want... I could add to that quickly. Yeah. Um, when I was at PepsiCo, I reported to the head of corporate strategy. I view this as 100% a, stretched, a strategic job. It's moving out of comms and marketing. Um, and we conduct every year what we call the investor trust barometer, which um, surveys over 600 institutional investors globally. Um, and those investors this year, by wide, wide margin, indicated that the head of ESG was one of the top three executives that they wanted to hear more from in engagements. So my takeaway is that that's, that means they're thinking about it as a core business function, not a storytelling function. Although that's giving context around the data, as we described before, is very important as well. So people can understand what you're doing. Yeah. So yeah, Bruno, but that I want to make strategy a, is critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bruno, I want to make a shift. Um, and when it, uh, Charles asks, 
What are insurance companies doing with climate change in the USA and their ratings of various areas? What changes, if any, is the federal government making to factor in rates based on climate change? Yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, that's a critical sector. Um, you know, I think one of the, the CEOs of one of the, the, the largest insurance companies, uh, uh, AXA, which happens to be uh, Europe-based, but uh, does a lot of business, you know, he, he was famous for saying, you know, a, a, a two degree plus world is uninsurable. Um, uh, and, you know, you're starting to see that a little bit. I mean, you know, obviously people in California have known this for quite some time around things like insurance companies long ago removed earthquake coverage saying, yeah, you know, like because we can't really insure for that risk. So we're just taking it out. And if you want to buy it separate, it's going to cost you a lot. I think that's also happening rapidly for things like wildfire risk. I think anybody who owns coastal property in places like Florida, Louisiana, you know, the outer banks, you know, soon may not, you know, have, uh, you know, base coverage for, for things like, uh, you know, coastal events, like, you know, hurricanes, uh, uh, tidal surges, those kinds of things. Um, and, I, you know, I don't have visibility so much as to what the government is doing. I mean, FEMA, as we know, has been, pretty much, you know, uh, over overextended every time, every time there's a there's a, a catastrophic weather event, you know, they they have to basically go for additional emergency funding, because even their level of base funding is, is fundamentally inadequate. I think FEMA also has a rule that if you if you get FEMA uh, insurance once the same property can't get it again for a similar events. So again, if if you're looking at potentially repeating um, events like flooding or or catastrophic storms that could be an issue i think the large reinsurers of the world you know the the munich rees and swiss rees um, are also looking at you know how to factor this in uh because they look at long-term models that say you know risk factors are, are rapidly increasing i think the way they write policies they tend to uh you know have an opportunity to adjust their rates relatively frequently so for them it's about how do you keep that policy holder for the next year or two so you know some of the insurance folks say they also suffer a little bit from short-termism because they don't have a long-term exposure because they could uh, rescind policies uh, you know on a, on a more short-term basis but I think that's that's a really important um, consideration over the long term is what is the insurability of uh, of a climate disrupted future? And so um, I could keep going. I don't know about it. You could keep going, but I could keep going. <laughs> um, but we are, you know, we're reaching the end, end of our time. So just very briefly, um, I actually like to ask each of you, you know, thinking back in the conversation we've had over the past hour. You know, something for everybody to take away as they have their lunch at home or maybe increasingly have their lunch in, in the office or wherever they are. Um, but something to take away to when they're with family, when they're with friends, when they're with colleagues. Here's something you want to be thinking about when it comes to investing in climate change. And we'll just do it from Suzanne, Heidi, and then Bruno. So Suzanne first. Yeah, I think going back to kind of what Bruno said is is really the market for ESG investing is completely transformed. And I think that you don't have to sacrifice returns to align and integrate um, your investment strategies uh, with either, as Heidi said, your, your values or really understanding maybe going in ESG strategy, how does it help um, just invest in better companies that are more prepared for the risks like climate and then the changing world. Um, and I think the other thing I would just say is, you know, again, this is a journey for everybody. And so even starting these conversations or looking at the one or two things you can change um, that are meaningful to you in your life and, and where you can make impact. And, and the biggest piece is don't underestimate, as Bruno said, the value of asking a question to your employer to your city or town or to, you know, your financial advisor or, the, or your bank or credit union, because those those questions are what's actually fueling people to think differently and, and make some changes. Heidi? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're in a corporate environment, many uh, companies have employee resource groups or some call them business resource groups. And some of the environmentally focused groups are at a place where they um, are quite sophisticated and play a meaningful role in corporate decisions. 
Um, so that could include, you know, developing a proposal for including an ESG focused fund in the fund selections for the 401k plan. Um, we heard that the, you know, the Biden administration won't be um, enforcing um, some of the, the DOL um, positions that were taken under the past administration. Um, some of these groups can do things as far as, you know, creating plans to reduce water use or change a policy so that there are no more plastic bottles used in, in a facility. Um, so I think that ground up um, engagement is a really great start um, because then you're working at it from a personal perspective, but also can influence your organization. Bruno? Yeah, no, I think um, all, all of that makes a lot of sense. I think look at what you invest in and why. I think going back to some of these motivations Heidi talked about earlier, and are there things where you're just trying to express or align with your values? You know, maybe if you're about, you know, the transformation of the food system to more plant-based alternatives, there's been some exciting IPOs, you know, is that uh, like like Oatly or, or beyond, you know, is that, okay, like, is that kind of what drives you? I think uh, beyond what you invest in, who you invest with, you know, we had a question earlier about, you know, do I want this bank to hold my money if they're also funding pipelines? So I think also looking at whether it's your, your brokerage, your bank, but also very importantly for many Americans, uh, 401ks or 403bs is where most of their investing happens. Absolutely demand better choices. Look at what your choices are. Demand better choices if they're not there. Again, uh, latest uh, guidance on on these things is is again, you know, more favorable to uh, to ESG products and certainly uh, demand choices across asset classes. You know, historically it's been very much on the large cap, uh, but uh, there's there are choices really across asset classes, um, and and just that fact of verbalizing that demand, verbalizing that interest, demanding that transparency. And uh, and maybe some of the quality that Heidi was talking about in the prospecti, and uh, uh, to make sure that the investors know that people are looking, are reading, um, and uh, uh, you know, I think when we when we speak to those whose behavior we want to change, it matters. When we speak to those whose behavior we like, it also matters. So don't always focus on the things people or organizations don't do well enough, but also reward companies if you like what they're doing with their. Um, with their products, with their behaviors, with their values, with their uh, practices, uh, because that goes a long way too. Even when I worked in a very large company, if one customer put out a tweet or something that uh, that praised the company's practices, that thing went around. You know, it it, it, it matters. It, gets seen. it does. Well. Thank you very much for taking your time. I really appreciate it. It's been a wonderful discussion. And thank you to uh, the audience and the people who sent in their questions. I really appreciate that. Our guests have been Bruno Sarda. He is a professor at Arizona State University's Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation. Heidi Du Bois is head of EASG for Edelman, the global public relations consultancy. And Suzanne Fallender is director of corporate responsibility at Intel. I'm Chris Farrell for NPR News. This broadcast, The Greener Good, presented by NPR News and Bank of America, was produced by Kelly Gordon. Thank you.